All right, I know that was a whole lot of information and you're about to get um, another serving of more science, but I promise um, I'm not gonna get too deep into the details. I'm trying to leave you guys, or leave you guys with the key messages and main points to some of the science and lessons learned from the impacts to our wildlife and people in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, um, I know Chapa introduced me as Christine Setter, and I used to work here in the Virgin Islands. Um, that was my maiden name, now I'm Chris Hale. I go by those. I'm based at XAM Corpus Christi. And so Monica left us with how oil got to the seafloor, so I figured that would be a good place to start with describing some of these impacts. And so I tried to pick species and habitats that might be of concern here in the Caribbean region. So of course, coral. So in general, scientists were looking at how oil dispersants impacted coral communities in these three zones. You've got your shallow water zone, of course, that's where we're familiar with our beautiful coral reefs here in the islands. Um, a little bit deeper, you have the mesophotic zone, which we also have here in the islands. Um, and very deep down, you have a deep sea zone. So these three zones are known to contain um, a variety of coral species and associated animals in these communities. Um, after, during the deep water horizon, event, um, there was what is called the Natural Resource Damage Assessment. So um, scientists were monitoring um, and watching what was going on in the environment, and um, later on, the damage assessment was sort of a summary of what that impact was to the environment. The Natural Resource Damage Assessment is part of the legal process when a spill uh, event occurs. And, um, they found in that damage assessment that there was no impact in that shallow water zone from the deep water horizon from the spill. So that shallow zone pushed to the shore, they didn't find or locate any oil in those reefs. However, in the mesophotic zone and deeper down in the deep sea zone, there was an impact. So starting with the mesophotic zone. Of course, mesophotic means middle light. So there's less light in this area. Um, and that means there's a variety of different coral species that lives there. Um, they were looking at these sort of in general called soft coral, um, so they're Gorgonians. And um, some scientists went out to look at the health of these soft corals in the mesophotic zone. So they went down and photographed with our ROVs um, some of those coral species, and um, that was in 2011, so that's your, your left-hand column there. They went back and returned in 2014 and took some more photos. Those green lines you see there are just the reflection um, off of the reflective tape they used to mark these corals so they knew which ones to look at when they returned. Um, well, as you can see from the photos, there's definitely some damage. So these corals were directly underneath the oil slick in that mesophotic zone. So deep down, but underneath the, the oil slick. And as Monica described earlier, um, that is from the process of transfer from the oil falling down through the water column and settling down on that bed on the sea floor. And of course, um, as part of the natural resource damage assessment process, um, there were recommendations made for restoration, and in that section of that damage assessment, of course, there was discussion about um, how long will it take these corals to recover, and it will probably take um, hundreds of years because these types of corals grow very slowly. All corals grow slowly, but as you go deeper down, it takes longer for them to grow. Um, very extreme environments, lower light conditions. And the mesophotic zone is also very important because it's been identified recently, actually, that this zone um, acts as sort of a transition between the shallow and the deep corals. So there's a lot of larval exchange between species. So this is a very important, ecologically important area for a lot of animals in these communities. Diving a little deeper, the deep sea zone also experienced negative impact from the oil and dispersant fallout. So again, coming back to that idea of how oil and dispersant transfers down to the deep sea, some uh, scientists went out and they documented what they call flocculent. So flocculent is basically that marine snow that's falling down from the surface and it had um, oil and dispersants attached to it. So this. Um, marine snow fell down, settled on these coral branches in the deep sea. Coral naturally produces uh, mucus 
to help rid itself of any foreign materials, whether it's oil, whether it's sediment, anything that they don't want on them, they use this mucus to slough off that foreign material. So that marine snow that had oil dispersant settled on the mucus, the mucus kind of mixed with it, and it turned into this brown, clumpy material. Scientists termed that flock. So they documented the effect of this flock over time. Again, using photographs at such a deep um, zone, it's really hard for humans to access this area. So photographic evidence is very important. And they found that initially in 2010, the corals were covered by that flock <coughs> material. Um, some of the tissues, the coral tissue itself, started to come off. There was some degradation. Um, later on in 2010, it looked like maybe they were doing okay, possibly, possibly resilient. However, they returned the next year, and they noticed that um, hydroids had moved in. And so hydroids are a stinging organism, and they're known to ecologists and biologists to be um, colonizing. So they'll come in um, and take over any area or space they can find. So that was a red flag to the scientists that this isn't a good thing. And then, of course, later on in 2012, they again returned and they documented coral branch loss and even death. And again, this is a very deep habitat, very cold environment, um, no light, and things take a really, really long time to grow. And hence, um, some of these corals are hundreds to thousands of years old. Um, experts predict that it will take a very, very long time for these specific corals to recover, if at all. You might be wondering what that sort of blobby thing is in the middle, um, right here. That, um, for those who might be unfamiliar, this is a brittle sea star. And scientists have shown that brittle sea stars tend to have a relationship with these corals, a lifelong relationship, in fact. They will settle on that coral, anchor themselves onto that coral, and then spread their arms to collect food out of the water. During the spill, um, the scientists documented that these brittle sea stars actually acted as a sort of a level of protection for the coral. So the areas where there was flock settling on the coral, it settled on the sea star instead. And so there's another study that shows that um, those sea stars can help. However, in this instance, these sea stars gave up and abandoned. And of course, um, we can't prove that the sea star decided to leave its home because of the oil. We didn't ask or interview the sea star. But, you know, it is um, of important note and it is noted in the Natural Resource Damage Assessment as well. Another really important um, question and discussion point that we've encountered quite often is that of dispersants and coral. So of course, Monica covered what dispersants are and how they are used in emergency response. And they're only used in certain situations. And of course, Deepwater Horizon was a very unique and extreme situation where dispersants were used both at the surface and subsea. But people still wanted to know how dispersants impact coral. So a group of scientists um, collected samples of those mesophotic and deep sea corals brought them back to the lab, and exposed that coral, of course, with permits, to uh, various doses of oil, of dispersant, the dispersant that was used during the response, and the oil from Deepwater Horizon. And they also mixed the two together. So they also exposed their coral to a mixture of oil and dispersant. They found, of course, <coughs> negative impacts across the board to all of the coral. However, um, oil and dispersant mixtures were much more harmful to the coral than oil alone and dispersant alone. Also, they did various um, concentration, concentrations and they found that the higher the concentration, the more damage was done. It's important to note, however, that what happens in the lab is not always what happens out in the real world. So there's still a lot of unknowns about how we apply these results in the real world when it comes to these energy response decisions. So, another species that I thought would be of importance here in my mind, sea turtles. Um, in our workshop yesterday in St. Croix, this led to a lot of interesting discussion. Um, basically, we know that sea turtles are highly migratory species, right? So they move all over the place, um, all over the Caribbean, all over the Gulf, all over the world. And we know 
that all of the habitats that sea turtles rely on were oiled during the spill. So the beaches where they lay eggs and nests, um, off sh or on the continental shelf and on the continental edge, where they feed and where they mate. Um, they also utilize sargassum during their life cycle, so that they'll use that floating sargassum to, um, for shelter protection and look for food there as well. That sargassum was also oiled and any turtles associated with that sargassum were oiled. And they also have an oceanic stage where they swim very, very far away, and for the most part, we don't know what happens to those turtles when they swim away. But that open ocean was also exposed to oil. So all of these important habitats um, put these sea turtles, a protected and endangered species, at risk. So there's a lot of tension, of course, on sea turtles. Um, and the emergency response community did a phenomenal job of responding and rescuing. Um, state, federal, local organizations came together to go out and um, remove those nests, because if there were nests there during that time, they excavated those nests and actually flew those nests that they could find to Florida um, on the Atlantic coast and um, replanted, I don't know if you could plant a nest, but <laughs> put them back down there um, so to give them, a, give them a better chance of survival. Um, they also pulled many sea turtles from the oil itself. <clears throat> However, despite this effort, there was um, a very dramatic and negative impact. And this is the part of my talk where things get really depressing for a little while, so hang in there. Um, it's estimated, again, the resource damage assessment oh, it estimates that for hatchlings, uh, about 35,000 were lost. 55 to 160,000 small juveniles were killed, and between 4,900 and 7,600 large juvenile and adult sea turtles were lost. So these are estimates, um, and it also includes um, potential loss from the sea turtles that um, would have made it had they survived. So um, it, it's, again, just an estimate. It could be higher than this. However, as depressing as that is, there are a lot of scientists working to better understand turtle migration um, so that we can um, do a better job during and before a spill event to predict where turtles will be so that we can make better decisions during response. Um, one group of scientists are using computer models using already existing migration data. So some scientists have tagged turtles and followed them. So they're using some of this data to get an understanding of known nesting locations in other parts of the world and if any of those turtles were in the Gulf of Mexico during the spill event, and they found that a lot of turtles actually originated in Mexico. The turtles that were in that area during the Deepwater Horizon event. And um, Costa Rica, Northern South America, and West Africa were also turtles that were found, or predicted to have been in the Gulf of Mexico during that time. And this study is important because it offers um, a point of view that we need to increase our, our multinational cooperation and collaboration when it comes to understanding this species and, and working together to um, improve our planning and our response and conservation of this protected species. More sad news. Um, so about a year after <coughs> Deepwater Horizon spill event, there was this very unusual mass stranding event of dolphins in the northern Gulf of Mexico along the beaches. About 1,000, 1,101 uh, bottlenose dolphins uh, beached themselves up on shore. And there was, of course, a lot of question out there about was this a result of this spill. It wasn't um, immediately a result of this spill. There's a lot of other conditions happening at that time to dolphins. There was um, colder temperatures at that time, there was an influx of fresh water into their environment, um, there was also bacteria and viruses in some of these dolphins. However, they were exposed to the Deepwater Horizon oil. And as you can see in this graphic, you know, dolphins, as most of us know, have to come up and breathe air, so they um, inhaled it, ingested it. So scientists compared the health of dolphins in the Barataria Bay area, which is where most of these strains occurred, they compared the health of these dolphins to dolphins in um, areas that were not oils. And they concluded that 
because these dolphins were exposed to oil, that contributed to that mass draining event. Birds. Um, so again, another highly migratory species. Um, these birds fly everywhere, obviously. There's a table here showing some of the areas um, that we know um, were oiled and where we picked up, not we, but the scientists and experts picked up um, some of these injured birds. And the Natural Resource Damage Assessment um, estimates that between 56,000 and 102,000 birds of 93 different species um, were lost due to the deep water horizon oil spill. They also note that this is probably on the very low end of the estimate because there are a lot of habitats that um, the response folks weren't able to access, like those offshore um, colonies on outcroppings and small islands they couldn't access, or if a bird was oiled and attempted to fly and hide somewhere inland. There's a lot of uncertainty with this number, but this also includes potential offspring had the parents um, not died. So moving into fish. Um, of course, this is a really big question for um, the Gulf of Mexico, very dependent on our, our fish for seafood and recreation and other, other things. Um, but it's not such an easy question. So scientists um, at that time, this is from around 2011, decided to look at this question in three sort of separate sections. They wanted to understand the oil's impact to the organism itself, so an individual fish. And if they could find a negative, neutral, or positive impact, they want to understand if that impact actually transfers up through the population level as well as to the community level. So if a fish is injured as an organism, if that one is injured, um, what will happen to its population. And if that population fails or does better, if it fluctuates, um, how's that, how is that community going to react? So starting at that sort of basic organismal physical impact, um, there's a lot of research looking at the, the genetic response um, of fish to oil exposure. And this is actually well known in the oil spill science literature. Um, I'll do my best, I'm not a geneticist, but there is a gene called CYP1A that um, scientists look at. If this gene is expressed in a vertebrate's body, that's a signal that that gene being turned up, kind of like if, it's been expo if an animal's been exposed to oil, this gene goes into action and it can start breaking down and ridding its body of that toxin. So scientists are looking for expression of this gene in certain organisms. Other organisms don't have this gene expression, like jellyfish. Jellyfish tend to accumulate um, oil compounds in their bodies. And don't worry, all these slides are going to be made available to you guys later on. Um, so even though fish are really good at breaking down the bad stuff in their bodies, scientists did find some negative impacts um, to them. And so this is um, a killifish, a gulf killifish. Um, they're often used in these types of studies because gulf killifish tend to stay um, in their little bays. They don't travel too far away from their home. So scientists can um, look at the fish to determine if it's been exposed and attribute that to its environment. So they looked at these killifish in those oil bays and marshes and estuaries. They found that Oil exposure caused developmental problems, a variety of developmental problems. Um, decreased size, deformities. Other studies found on other species that oil exposure at a young age can um, result in trouble with swimming later on in life. Of course, if a fish can't swim, it can't get away from problems like a shark or a person. Um, so, a variety of problems. However, that is very much dependent on a fish's life stage. These fish are more susceptible to injury at younger ages. So at the egg and larval stage, they're very sensitive to oil. As they get older, they're much more resilient. And it's also dose dependent too. So the concentration and length of time of exposure has a lot to do with what will result in that fish's health. Another really big fish health question we had um, following the spill. Um, a lot of offshore fishermen were reporting 
seeing these skin lesions right here. It's kind of a gross picture, I know, but these lesions were found on multiple species offshore. A lesion, of course, is a, is a wound, and it's really hard to determine uh, where that lesion comes from. So, uh, oh, and also, it's not very common to see lesions on fish offshore. It's more common closer to shore where there's more prevalence of pollution and contaminants and, and other sources of injury, but not offshore. So this was a, a red flag to the fishermen. Fishermen communicated that to the scientists. So the scientists incorporated this into the research plan. And they went out and they sampled all these fish um, in oiled areas. And this kind of work had never been done before. There has never been a, a long-term sort of lesion focus, fish health focus, and offshore fish like this before the spill. So the scientists approaching this question had nothing to compare the current evidence to previous evidence. So they had to work with about three years of data that they collected from about 2011 to 2014. And they found there was an increase in oil compounds in the water where the fish had, were seeing lesions. So those locations where there was oil, was there were a lot of fish with lesions. So they confirmed what the fishermen suspected. There was oil compounds and there were lesions. However, the challenge was figuring out, was the oil coming from Deepwater Horizon or was it coming from another source? In the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of sources of oil. Um, the biggest one being natural seeps. So at the bottom of the ocean floor, there's natural seeps. There's over 900 known seeps where oil comes into the environment. So that's just one of the sources. These scientists looked at all the potential sources and using samples of the deep water horizon oil, were trying to fingerprint this. They were not able to 100% confirm that the oil compounds they were identifying in these lesioned areas came from deep water horizon. So it's still unclear if deep water horizon caused these lesions. However, um, it did happen in that time period. But when they went out later, the prevalence of those lesions um, dropped if they went away, and the level of pHs in the water also dropped down. So scientists conclude that it was an epi episodic exposure event. <coughs> Another um, interesting study looking at sort of fish communities is um, this one by Dr. Susan Snyder. Um, she wanted to look at um, means of exposure, so how certain fish species are exposed to oiled sediment. So she looked at this deep sea community and she specifically looked at three species. She looked at the golden pilefish, the red snapper, and the king snake eel. And she chose these three species because they're of their very unique um, behavior. So golden pilefish tend to burrow. They do what's called bioturbating. They use their mouth and their fins to um, dig their burrow deep into the sediment, and they do that all day long to maintain their burrows. Uh, red snapper, they, uh, as you know, for, uh, those of us who like to fish, um, they spend their time up in the water um, associating with natural structures like reefs or artificial reefs or oil rigs, anything. Um, they'll sometimes come down to the sediment to grab a snack if they see it, but they don't burrow like that by any means. The king snake eel, that guy, he hovers um, on the surface he'll, of the sediment. He'll, again, he'll dig a little bit and get some snacks too, but he doesn't uh, burrow as much as the golden tilefish. So they went out and sampled these guys, these fish, and they found an increase of those compounds, those PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, in the liver of these fishes, in the, in the bile as well, and they found that during the sampling period, there was a very high level of those, those compounds in the fish's bodies. Um, however, over that three year period, the level of oil compounds in their bodies dropped for the red snapper and the king snake eel. It didn't drop for the golden tile fish. It persisted over time. So they're posing that because of this burrowing behavior, that golden tile fish continues to re-expose itself to any oil sediment that might be in its home or in its neighborhood. Um, and that, of course, is useful information for making decisions about seafood. Maybe we need to closely monitor organisms that have a higher um, risk of being exposed to oil. 
Um, another way that uh, scientists are trying to understand this sort of fish and fisheries and seafood question is that of um, food webs. So some scientists were looking at the diets of red snappers. Um, they were doing some gut analyses and looking to see what snappers were eating. They found that before the oil spill, red snappers were very opportunistic feeders. Um, they would eat whatever they come across, including plankton. So about 15 to 20 percent of their natural diet includes plankton. However, after the oil spill happened, it appears that the red snapper diet shifted. They cut open the, all the guts of all these fish once again, and they found that there was a, a decrease in the plankton in their guts, but an increase in all of their other menu items, so squid, shrimp, crabs, other fish. And they posed that during the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, but there was a big, massive plankton die-off, which contributed to the marine snow event and um, contributed to getting the transfer of oil to the sea floor. So without that um, plankton menu item available to the red snapper, they shifted to focus on other available food. And this kind of information is important because it adds to this complicated food web understanding. So. Um, what scientists are trying to do is move towards this, these big picture questions um, and how to use this information to make decisions in response. So I know this is a complicated graphic and it's not very clear. This is a pretty new paper um, and it's um, focusing on marsh food webs. So these scientists went out and they came up with a ranking of sensitivity of certain organisms in this food web and they were ranking how sensitive these animals and plants are to oil. Um, the blue is less sensitive and red is more sensitive and yellow is somewhere in the middle. And of course there's a lot of species we don't have any information on about sensitivity. And they got all this information from other research that's already been done. So they compiled all like uh, about 124 papers to put this together. So they were looking at sensitivity of organisms. At the same time, they were looking at the connections of these of these organisms to each other in this food web. So all these connectivity lines here um, represents how important those species are in that food web. And so they rated all of this because they want to offer that if you know how sensitive or non-sensitive a species is to oil exposure, you can make a decision about how to handle oil coming towards an environment. And so they found, for example, where's my blue crab? Blue, right here. So blue crab um, is higher up um, and more important in this sort of food web dynamic. They found that blue crab are very a very key species in this marsh food web, but they're just moderately sensitive to oil. However, um, grass shrimp are very sensitive to oil, but not as important in the food web structure. So this is just the beginning of an understanding of what they, they pose will be a framework for decision making. So that, for example, if, if grass shrimp are, are impacted during the spill, maybe that's not a big deal. Maybe that food web will maintain its resilience in the crash. However, other animals higher up on that trophic level, wading birds, gulls and terns, dolphins, if they're impacted, that could have some serious consequences. And again, this is early, but this is the direction that a lot of scientists are moving in. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna fly through some of these slides before our break, but basically, seafood is a, a, always a big question during oil spill events. During Deepwater Horizon, more than 22,000 samples of seafood were taken by state and federal and local partners, and none of them were found to um, be contaminated, and actually they were very low, very low on the level of concern, below the level of concern that FDA has set. Um, and Sea Grant was involved in training the seafood industry during that time to identify potentially tainted seafood. Again, there wasn't any, but um, Sea Grant held training sessions across the Gulf to help the industry understand what's being done about this because there was a lot of anxiety and stress related to seafood. Um, so that helps me move a little bit into these sort of mental health impacts that we're beginning to understand. Um, of course, there's a lot of stress related to folks who work in the, the oil industry because the oil industry halted during that time. The vacations were canceled, so tourism industry was impacted. And the natural resource livelihoods like um, the fisheries community, they were impacted. So there's a lot of stress and anxiety, uncertainty related to what was going to happen. Um, so, 
again, I have to speed up here. One really important study showed that um, they went out and interviewed a lot of residents in Louisiana, which was highly impacted by this bill, um, trying to get a better handle on their health. And they found that um, residents with high levels of community attachment, so community attachment is the idea that we're all connected to each other, we have strong personal relationships, we're very connected to the place that we live. People who have strong community attachment and those who are tied to our natural resources, remember the, um, the fishing community, the oil industry, um, they reported a lot of negative feelings, anxiety, nervousness, fear. Um, these scientists returned a year after this study, or a year after this bill, and they found that those feelings had subsided due to the community attachment. So that community was able to work together to pull through that bad time. But that wasn't true for all residents. The fishing community still suffered. So and in some cases, their, their feelings, their negative, negative feelings increased over time. So these scientists posed that although community attachment is really great for some groups, you need to pay particular attention to other groups like the fishing industry because perhaps the fishing industry is very tied to each other. They usually have very strong community networks. And so those negative feelings are being shared among the community. And so what they were seeing was possibly a snowballing effect with that negative feeling over time. So some of those other negative feelings um, were also coming from perception of those in charge. There's a lot of blame and distrust of the responsible party and even of the state and local agencies. Of course, drawn out litigation, so the legal process, the claims process associated with compensation. So those that were impacted, like the fishing communities and the oil industry, whose uh, livelihoods were temporarily shut down, they were claim putting in claims. And that process, over time, took a long time for this process, is continuing to exasperate those um, mental health conditions. Despite that negativity, we do know there's attributes that we can focus on to help a community become resilient, strong social networks, people that report having a strong sense of purpose in life, whatever that means to you, having a strong sense of purpose in life helps you become more resilient. Um, those who have lived through another disaster perceive themselves as being more resilient. These are kinds of qualities that um, can be focused on for more resilience. It's important to note, too, that um, Risk communication is really important during a spill, and it's recognized that some federal and state agencies don't have or are not necessarily allowed to share information. So it's important to set up um, or have relationships set up beforehand, so like right now, set up relationships with people that have working relationships with communities, such as CBO, so that if you're a federal agency involved in response and cannot share information, lots of people aren't trusting you, Go with people who are trusted. Set up the communication network ahead of time with trusted individuals in certain areas before it still happens. Um, and so how do you do this? We've been learning this as a team for some time now that these area communities, I don't know if you're familiar with them here in Puerto Rico, um, you have your Caribbean regional um, area meetings that happen this week actually in St. Croix. That's a regional response team meeting. You're all welcome to attend those meetings. Those are meetings where response individuals come together and discuss response plans and they're looking for more attendance by different community groups, different voices, so that they can work your ideas into their response plans ahead of time and understand what are the sensitive areas both with people and with the environment. So area committee meetings, regional meetings, if you want more information about that, come to me and I can help explain that. Also, know your wildlife rescue and rehabilitation um, resources um, and networks, locations ahead of time. Get to know your public health facilities. Get to know your tourism industry and your fishing industry because those are the ones that are going to be impacted, especially here in the area. Uh, Steve told me, or mentioned that I was going to go over some resources. Um, he mentioned our website. All of this information and any of the seminars and workshops we do, we try to get all those materials on our website, so I encourage you to visit that and browse. Um, also, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative has tons of resources, most notably the Grid C database. If you're interested in data, it's all available from their home page, as is all of their publications, all of their educational materials, podcasts, blogs, lesson plans, 
Um, you can learn more about dispatches from the Gulf. And also, I wanted to note here, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative has made a lot of progress with building international relationships, specifically, of course, with Mexico and Cuba, since we all are those three entities, US, Mexico, Cuba, share the Gulf of Mexico environment. Um, but they have worked uh, really hard to build these international relationships, and it's a really great example um, for other regions. Um, and most of those relationships are academic, but they're working towards um, the response community as well in those nations. So if you want more information about those relationships, come talk to me. Um, some other data sources, again, you don't have to scroll these down, I'm going to make these available to you. Um, NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration has um, a wonderful website, NOAA Incident News, which Steve mentioned earlier. The job aids are what the response industry uses um, in training and learning how to respond to different types of spills. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting information there. Diver has more information and data as does the environmental response management application as well, maps available there um, related to oil spill and oil spill response. So that was really quick because I ran out of time. But again, that's the dream team. Um, we're all here to answer your questions and work with you and get to know you better and build these relationships and continue this relationship going forward.